The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tracy Earle from the Safe Communities Foundation New Zealand, and I'm your host for this webinar. Today we have apologies from Megan Brotherton from the Australian Safe Communities Foundation and Tanya Peters um, from Safe Communities New Zealand, who both have other commitments. So uh, before we start, just a few housekeeping matters. Uh, we will have time for questions um, at the end of each presentation, and we want this to be interactive, so please feel free to ask questions. Each uh, participant will have um, access to the GoToWebinar control panel on your screen. If you could familiarise yourself with, this, with its features, that would be great. Uh, if you're having any problems, please send a message via the control panel, and I will endeavour to help you out with it. If you'd like to ask a question during presentations, please um, type your question in the question area in the control panel, or, or you can um, put your hand up. To, that's electronically, of course. Please, um, you do this by clicking on the yellow hand on your control panel. At the end of each presentation, depending on the time available, the presenters will try to answer the questions. Uh, if for some reason your question isn't answered, the presenters will provide an email address at the end of their session for you to correspond with them personally. And this webinar is being recorded and it'll be available for viewing early next week and we will advise of that. So today we have two presentations, both from New Zealand Safe Communities and both were shared at the New Zealand um, Safe Communities National Forum, which was held last month. And they have so much interest in both of them we decided to share them with the wider audience. So today our first presenter is Lauren Tamihana from Safer Whanganui. And for those of you not familiar with New Zealand geographically, Whanganui is situated on the lower west coast of the North Island. Lauren's been working full time at the Whanganui District Council as the Safer Whanganui project leader. Uh, since not 2014, but has been involved with Safer Whanganui since its inception in 2008. Today, Lauren is going to talk about creating supportive environments from the background in her presentation called Smokes and Mirrors. Over to you, Lauren. Uh, kia ora. Thanks, Tracy, for that, and uh, I'll get into my presentation. So, today I'm just going to talk about some examples around influencing change um, with the aim of giving you all some take home messages. So in the past, uh, before uh, Safer Whanganui was in place and before we had someone working within council, um, council would develop policy and uh, our partners out in the community would and they'd put that out for submission. And our partners in the community would then, the only way we were able to influence was using the submission process. So our Safer Wanganui partners would work together. And uh, some examples of this is uh, with Public Health, we developed a postcard submission. The, uh, this was quite labour intensive, but the outcome was that council were inundated with postcard submissions that often challenged their harm minimisation focus. The changes that have appeared, that have happened in council uh, in the last, I guess, probably the last three to four years, um, with change um, in mayor and then the safer Wanganui position, so my position, um, been was moved or was changed to a full time position. So it means that we've taken on some technical expert roles. So when council are looking at policy now, they um, and it's got anything to do with uh, Safer Whanganui in its broader sense. Um, so often we get involved in all sorts of things. Um, they, where they come to us and we provide the technical expertise in the development of the policy. So this means that by the time the policy gets out to community, we've got some really strong harm minimisation focus. It also means we've got some great support around the submission process even before we get um, out to submission as well. So some examples of that is our alcohol control bylaw. This lapsed last year 
um, just we discovered leading up, so it was about October we discovered it had lapsed and uh, concerned, we were really concerned along with the police that we were going to end up going into a, our festive season without a um, alcohol control bylaw in place. Um, and so we did quite a bit of work on um, updating the bylaw and looking for opportunities of where we might suggest some change to what we had in the original bylaw. We were able to, um, with an intense push from Safe Whanganui, we were able to get this across the line in December, just in time for our police to have some additional support over the over the festive season. Um, with the extra push, we managed to include our children's parks into the bylaw, which we hadn't had before as well. So we were able to get that in through the beginning, and then um, when it went, once it went out for submission, it uh, was a fairly easy process. And in fact, from memory, I don't think we had anyone that submitted against the alcohol control bylaw. Currently, we've got a provisional lap. Um, and although it's taken a very long time, Safe Wanganui were involved in the de beginning developments of the provisional of the lap probably four years ago. Um, we're really pleased with the outcome. We really pushed hard to get some uh, key parts of the lap in place. Um, and so we've gone for 9.30 closings for bottle sh stores and supermarkets. Um, and we've in included children's parks and playgrounds into the sensitive site. Again, that I means quite a bit of work from Safer Whanganui to support policy team to get all the data that they needed. But also it meant that once we got that out there, we were able to provide the support uh, from a submission process. And I, the third example is that um, we've just been involved in the development of the smoke-free, vape-free outdoor areas policy causing a little bit of controversy um, nationwide. It caused a little bit of controversy. So when I was down at the National Forum, um, we managed to hit the national headlines and national news, but um, we're standing strong on what we believe is the right thing we're doing for our community. Um, so while we think about that, um, this next slide, I'm just going to talk about Oh, went one too far. Sorry, I'll just go back one. Um, there, I just want to talk about the advantages and disadvantages to being a council employee. So in the past, fully participating in the submission process has not always been easy. Um, but this has changed, or this, this has been enabled to be changed since I've come on board into the role. And I guess some of that is just around the um, the influence that I have. So at the moment, I'm able to write submissions on behalf of Safer Whanganui, and this is then taken up and used by our partners, which enables us to get a cons um, consistent support in the key areas. So I have a, the unique position of being a council officer and still being able to not only write submissions, but also do verbal presentations and with the strength of 13 organisations sitting behind me. So the photo, that the slide that I've got at the moment is a, a slide of me uh, vaping in the council chamber. Um, so it's not illegal to vape uh, inside at this point currently, and so we use that as a way to um, show our councillors um, that there, you know, that we need to think about what we're doing as far as vaping goes in our community. Um, and that's a really poor photo of me vaping because um, I'm not very good at it. I um, I did have a wee practice beforehand but was, and hoped to be able to blow copious amounts of smoke, but it never worked as well as um, I'd hoped. But I guess that um, the, the issue here is that I, the unique position that I'm in and that able, I'm able to um, complete that submission process and, and even though I am a council officer, which um, when I've talked to other colleagues, they do find it that they're constrained uh, working inside council from being able to fully participate in the submission process. But I've been allowed to do it here, which is really good. Um, this slide's just about 
getting people to think about sometimes it's where you sit your chair and the view that you have so um, these two views that I've got here on the screen are from taken from exactly the same position um, just turned my chair slightly one way uh, slightly from the right to the left and the, so that I'm still sitting in the same place but my view and my focus is different um, and so I find that sitting inside council has enabled me or say for Whanganui to be involved in projects or processes that we wouldn't naturally have had the opportunity to be involved in. Um, so it's about being in the right place at the right time. Some examples of that is uh, we've just um, been involved in the welcoming communities pilot. Now uh, that piece of work is sitting alongside me with say for Whanganui and it's got some really clear linkages. So it's around um, refugee and migrant communities and welcoming them, welcoming them into our community and so um, we've got a real opportunity to ensure that we're providing some strong safety influence into our welcoming them into the community. Another example is um, lots of people want to meet with our mayor and, I, and so um, I have an opportunity to be involved in those meetings so Generally, um, people just said that they get a half hour meeting with the mayor, and those get popped into my diary now just automatically. And so I participate in those meetings as well. So it's really giving me a good opportunity to connect with people, um, but also to um, hear some of the other issues that we might not necessarily hear. And so I have uh, just earlier last month. Uh, facilitated a housing forum and so we looked at emergency housing and social housing for the community and that's something that we will be picking up and running with for now and, and I might lead that process to begin with and then the idea is that we'll step back a little bit but there's um, some huge issues for our community and around keeping them safe and some poor housing so that's one area that we're looking into and the other was just an opportunity to connect with people. So uh, a couple of, of um, brothers from one community have come up to talk to the mayor about what they're wanting to do in their community. And so this is linked in with me. And then I've had an opportunity to be able to follow that information up. So they were interested in having a community meeting and getting the community together and um, getting them thinking about uh, you know, being good neighbours and working together better and just really getting the community to connect. And I knew that they didn't have very many neighbourhood support groups up in that community, so what we've done is link them up together so that when they have their community meeting, neighbourhood su support are there and part of that community meeting so we can get some strength going in that uh, community as well. So I guess um, the key messages I just want to pe leave people with is that it's really important that um, in, the, in positions as safe communities that you are you have an opportunity to be involved in policy from the beginning. That it's really key that um, you can influence and, and the strength of your work can be from the beginning rather than having to come from behind and push the harm minimisation. So get to know your policy team and. Uh, at the councils, your local councils, and and just start the conversations. Shared submissions, um, it's really, really important that uh, there's an opportunity for shared submissions. It provides strength and consistent messaging, and this also gives your partners confidence in um, you as well. That's one thing that when we completed a submission on the suicide strategy, we worked closely with the DHB to ensure that what we were saying wasn't going to be in conflict to what the DHB was saying, so that um, they know that we're supporting the same messages. Um, where you sit can influence your um, your work, and so um, you know if you have the opportunity to think about sitting within council, there is a huge area that you can influence here. Not everyone in council knows or understands safe communities, but actually once you're in the door, then there's a huge opportunity for influence. And relationships, trust and connections are really key to this role. In past, um, some, an example of that is in past, some 
council staff have had an unusual relationship with the police and often um, they've struggled to get things done or they might not be happy with results when they've tried to get police on board for anything. That now generally comes through me and so I've got a, um, a strong relationship with the police and, and I know that when I uh, email them or give them a call about anything that generally we're going to get some process moving a little bit faster than may have happened in the past. And so um, key relationships and trust help make bring all of this together. And uh, any questions? Thank you, Lauren, for sharing your experience and for the practical advice that was in your presentation. I'm just looking to see if anybody's got any questions. No, I don't I'm see sorry, any. I don't have my email on here. Oh, if anybody wants to um, um, contact um, myself at Safe Communities or, or Megan Brotherton, we can always forge your details anyway. That's not a problem. Cool, thank you. Okay. No, we don't appear to have any questions at the moment. So we'll. Um, oh, hang on, we do. Just. Um, Um, Lauren, just one question here. Do you have any um, comments about the best strategies for building trust? Um, I think that that's just, you just got to keep uh, doing things and doing things well. So even if, for me, sometimes it's even if I don't see the clear connection to say for Wanganui, um, I will often participate just because it's around building reputation and trust and so that people, the more they see you, the more they um, think that you're a good person, that you're someone that's uh, connecting, you're, they're able to connect with. So I think that, yeah, the biggest thing is just being seen and, and participating in stuff, even if you don't always see the, the clear line of connection between for your safe community, um, generally it's there, but often it's just about um, building that relationship. Great, thanks for that, Lauren. Okay, we'll move on now to our uh, next presentation. I'd now like to introduce um, a second presenter for today. Sonia Thompson is a Community Development Officer at the Invercargill City Council and the Safe Community Coordinator for Safe in the South, which is New Zealand's southernmost safe community. And this includes Invercargill City and Southland District, which, which is situated right at the bottom of the South Island. In 2007, Sonia was a key player in gaining accreditation for Invercargill in the Southland District as a safe community. And she was well qualified for this before, um, before arriving in New Zealand. Her international experience working in Moscow and as a volunteer in Kenya has given her a really good appreciation of the importance of community. So Sonia's presentation today is on strategy development that she has been involved with, with Safer South. And there's a real focus on the successes and what they and the things they do differently next time. So Sonia, over to you. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. yes. Um, good thanks to everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction, Tracy. Um, yes, I'm coordinator of Safe in the South, and um, our Safe Communities Coalition covers the Southland District and the Invercargill City. And we gained our uh, accredited status in February 2016. And our accreditation document, um, hang on.
So in our accreditation document, we stated that once we achieve accredited status, then we would write a strategic plan. So I always knew that this is something that we had to do, um, but what it should like and where do I start um, was really a mystery to me. So I did some research and even though I didn't find a um, how-to guide for a nonprofit organization, there is a lot of information out there written for businesses by business professionals. So I tried to adapt this um, ideas world from businesses for the needs of our coalition. Along the way, some of the things worked and some not so well. So I would like to share with you um, our journey and uh, strategy development. So hopefully it will make your planning process easier and will help you avoid some mistakes. So in a nutshell, a strategic plan is a shared vision and a roadmap getting there. The first and probably the most important step of working on a strategy is building a strong foundation. You need to come up with a vision and mission statement and define your values as an organization. It is really important to get these things right and make sure that all of the members are happy with them as you will always come back to the foundation when making decisions. So vision statement uh, most importantly answers to the question, why does your coalition exist? It helps to clarify what's in and what's out for you as an organization. It should clearly communicate your coalition's overall goal and can serve a tool as in the, um, in the decision-making process. It is not really something that you can impose. And some suggestions for this would be um, dream big, uh, keep it short and use uh, simple, uh, clear language. All of your partners should be able to remember it, understand and repeat it if necessary. Um, and a general suggestion would be you should be able to put your vision on a t-shirt and be proud wearing it. Um, so what is a mission statement then? It is best to explain in comparison. So if you think of a vision as what you want to be in the future, it is a source of motivation and inspiration for you. Your mission is what you do now. This is your guide uh, for day-to-day -day operations. So I have a couple of examples uh, of vision statements uh, that I borrowed from Terry Tilby Price to illustrate what I've just said. So this vision that you see is a vision statement of a budget advice service, a community where people are empowered to make sound financial decisions so they can live a life of abundance and prosperity. It is very complex language, but it still fails to bring a strong idea across. I even had to look up um, word abundance in the dictionary. So later the vision was uh, changed to this, a community where nobody has to wake up and worry about the money. It is clear and concise, and most importantly, it really paints a mental picture. So values. Your values is how you want your organization to behave. We determined these values at our first strategy planning session. Um, we are one, we include, we innovate, we share, we understand, we respect, we trust, we support, we care, and we adapt. Principles. As an accredited safe community, we felt it was really important for us to mention safe communities model in our strategy, as uh, these principles are in the core of our work. Um, what you can see now is a metaphorical building. I'm a visual person myself, and I believe for many people like me, it can be challenging to grasp the whole concept. Um, so we try to avoid using boring charts and tables, and we came up with a structure. Um, so this building represents our coalition. In the middle, you can see four work streams, community, family, workplace, road, and farm. In, in the core of this building, there are two blocks, alcohol and youth, going across these four streams. So safe communities principles um, guide the work of safe in the self, together with the values. Um, it provides us with a strong framework to achieve our um, vision and mission. And just like in the building, 
uh, when an element of a construction is missing, um, the building is not solid, like our coalition, um, we like to think that we are strong we, when we're together. So once you have the foundation uh, and vision and mission and values, it is time to work on the actual strategic plan. Come up with objectives or goals and then break them into smaller pieces. Um, first, you need to understand um, where you are at, um, at this point in time. We did it by looking at data and statistics from our stakeholders. And we also run a community survey based on principles of appreciative inquiry. Um, when preparing for your strategic planning workshop, make sure that you give your members um, preparation material ahead of the meeting, all the information, data, states, reports that you can find, and also summarize that uh, in the beginning of the meeting. Keep it balanced. Because if it's too much information, three days before the strategy planning workshop, nobody will have time to read it. So once you've analyzed the data and you have your core principles that guide you, it doesn't have time to come up with a plan on how you're going to get from where you are to where you want to be. So you do it by identifying some key features, which are your strategic objectives or goals. Keep them smart. Uh, SMART is an abbreviation for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Realistic, Time-Bound. So we started off with seven goals, but only four goals made it into the strategy. Having a lot of goals would mean that we won't be able to focus on neither of them properly. And, um, and we decided to slash the number of objectives right down. Now looking back, I think that our objectives could, could have been even more specific. Now also strategizing is pointless unless you have a clear implementation plan. Each objective was then broken into smaller steps or uh, our action plan. Um, to have a reference um, who is responsible for which action, um, you need to have um, um, a lead agency, a time frame, and also how you go into measure success. So here is the um, extract of our strategy. You can see the um, objectives on the top and how the action measures leading agency um, and time frame going across them. I'm coming back. My suggestion here would be allow yourself um, a room to wiggle. It's impossible to plan for everything and your strategic plan may need adjustments in future. As new challenges or opportunities arise, um, they will be just too silly to miss. Um, as a coalition, you can also decide on time brackets for your, um, for, to meet and talk about this, um, the strategy specifically to adjust if necessary. We are a very young, safe community. And as a new coalition, we face some challenges, especially gaining recognition in the community across Southland and trust and support of potential stakeholders. To ensure growth of the coalition in success making Southland in a better place, uh, we need to continue building a better engagement with our stakeholders in the community. Um, so growing internal and external communications together with strengthening our brand will support the delivery of our strategy. In the strategic, plan, uh, in the strategic communication strategic plan, we outline what messages we want to deliver, who is our audience internally and externally, and what methods are we going to use to deliver messages to the audience. Now, with some experience, we'll look back and we know that there are some things that we will do differently next time. Uh, first is less is more. This is something that I've heard a lot from our advisor, uh, Mike Mills, during the strategy development process. And I'm very grateful for that piece of advice. Don't try to solve all the issues. It is impossible. It's better to focus on smaller goals. Break goals into smaller pieces and uh, be very specific with time frame for each goal. Keep meetings no longer than hour and a half. 
schedule more meetings um, if necessary, but working productively for a long time is really hard. Another thing worth mentioning um, is don't try to smash it in one session. Allow members of your coalition an opportunity to reflect on the discussions. Um, participating in a discussion and run meeting at the same time is really hard. Consider, consider a hiring a facilitator to run the workshop for you. An experienced facilitator will ensure everyone is engaged, and it's preferable if this person has an experience in community sector. And the last thing, um, minute taking, um, it's really essential. You don't need to write down every single thing, who said what, but the minutes should be a snapshot of the discussion and decisions made. So if you plan to actively participate in a discussion, it's easy to get carried away and miss important points. So if you can get an outside minute taker, you can get straight into discussions. And I would recommend to review and clarify the minutes while they're still fresh. And maybe keeping a record um, a recording of a meeting might be a good idea for future proofreading. And the conclusion I would like to say that having polarized views is normal. We don't need to look at things at the same angle. But if you find yourself in the middle of a discussion about objectives or action points, and you feel like it's just not going anywhere, return back to your vision and ask yourself, does it make us one step closer to where we want to be? And at last, creating a strategic plan is challenging and definitely time consuming, but it will make a difference once you have it in place as it will guide you to um, achieve your long-term goals. Um, so if you have any questions, you can get in touch with me um, or ask them now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanya. That was an awesome presentation and again, a lot of really um, good practical tips for our audience. And I really like the way that your presentation um, recognises the importance of sharing what didn't go so well and learning from these issues as well as what did go well. And sometimes I think we forget that. So thank you for that. We've got a few minutes for questions. Does anybody have any questions for Sanya? Yeah, we have one here from, um, oh, we just have a comment here from uh, Michael Maxwell in Blacktown, Australia, who we had the pleasure of at our national forum last month. And he just said it was a great presentation. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just see if there's any others before we close. No, no others there. But anyway, um, Sonia's contact details are there should you um, think of anything you'd like to ask her. And as I say, these um, presentations will be available for viewing online next week. So on, um, on behalf of all the participants today, I'd like to thank both our presenters for taking the time to share with us. And um, as I've already said, that, you know, the practical experiences are so valuable to learn from other people's practical um, experiences. So please feel free to email either of our presenters with any follow-up questions or um, you can send them through myself, the Safe Communities Foundation. Also, um, just a reminder to all participants to please fill out the survey on this webinar and let us know of any topics you'd like uh, this webinar series to address. We've got one more webinar this year and we're very shortly going to start planning our topics for next year. So we always welcome all feedback. Our next webinar um, is going to be on family violence with a focus on alcohol as a trigger, and that's going to be on the 31st of August. Oh no, 31st of August today, sorry, on Thursday the 26th of October. Um, so thank you everyone for your time today, especially our presenters. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.